Well, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to uh, sort of talk to you. I, I want to talk a little bit about the, the social context of nano. So I'm going to go quickly through the technology and, and get you into a lot of the work we've done with the public in terms of national polls and focus groups and how people are starting to feel about this. So let's just do a little bit on the technology. This is my favorite definition of nanotech from Richard Smalley, who won the Nobel Prize for the development of carbon buckyballs, the art and science of building stuff that does stuff at a nanometer scale. It's kind of a fuzzy definition, but I think it's, it's a very good one. Um, so what the building stuff about nanotech, this is, I, I compare this to the photograph of the footprint on the moon. Uh, this said, we got there at a nanoscale. Uh, this was done by some people at IBM who spelled out their logo uh, in xenon atoms. It took them about 22 hours to actually manipulate these individual atoms to spell out IBM. So this, at this point in time, we actually were able to reach down to an atomic scale and start manipulating stuff. Since then, we've come a long way. This is an example of Jim Tor's nano car. These are actual individual gold atoms. Uh, it's three to four nanometers across. It's got wheels. It's got axles. To give you some sense of just the, <clears throat> the incredible amount of control that we've got at those scales. Um, the secret here is when you get down to that scale, things do things differently. So if you take gold, I've got some gold fillings in my mouth. They tend to be relatively inert. Uh, gold particles at 70 nanometers are highly reactive. So I've changed the properties completely. If I take gold down to four to six nanometers, I can change its color three times. So this ability at that scale to change the chemical properties, the optical properties, the conductivity, uh, the way these, these substances interact with the environment, this is what gets people excited and also worried. Last year, $12.6 billion were invested in nanotech R&D globally by the public and private sector. Uh, the US government invests $1.4 billion last year. That's twice as much money as we invested in the Human Genome Project at the height of the Genome Project. So this is a huge government investment. You can add almost $2 billion investment by industry in this country. Uh, the states are investing probably another $400 million a year in nanotech R&D. And then you've got the venture capitalists who, depending on how optimistic they are, have been pumping $300 to $400 million a year into nanotech in the US alone. So there's an incredible amount of money. And obviously, some of the promises are certainly newer materials, the ability to filter water, desalinate water, uh, certainly the energy applications will be immense, as well as food and, and medicine. The National Cancer Institute's investing about $145 million a year just in using nanotech to develop new cancer diagnostic techniques and therapies. So all of this is on the horizon. What I want to talk about a little bit is the reality. We've actually created an inventory of nanotechnology products that are on the market. These are all products that are identified by the manufacturer as containing nanotech. It's obviously an undercount because not everything appears on the web. How many of you have seen some of these? OK. Some tennis players, uh, mountain bike frames, cosmetics, tennis balls. This is not the, sort of the cancer therapies. This is nanotech, the first generation. Uh, the golf balls, the, uh, <clears throat> the things you slip in your shoe to insulate your foot, quite interesting. Uh, we actually buy a lot of this. We have a huge kind of storefront of nanotech products that people can take a look at. So this is sort of nanotech, the reality. And I put this up here because I think that there's a tendency in, in, in the nanotech world to sort of exaggerate uh, quite often what's going on. I mean, this is a, if you haven't read this, it's a wonderful book by a, an English historian called The Shock of the Old. And basically, the, the message is there's, we're surrounded by a lot of old technologies. I mean, everyone keeps talking about the new stuff, but the reality is that we're surrounded by, we still rely on the internal combustion engine, steam power, basic chemical synthesis. All of these technologies were developed over a century ago. Uh, so this is kind of a reminder that we, as we sort of look forward, we need to also be thinking about how technologies are actually used uh, by us on a daily basis. Uh, another little comment by Richard Feynman about the need to <clears throat> focus on reality rather than always on promise or public relations. So let's go back and look at the products. One of the things is the number of products are increasing significantly. Some of the largest increases are in clothing and cosmetics, personal care products. Uh, we're seeing the beginning of, of nanotech applications in food and food packaging. 
And what we found in our inventory is the number of products have actually doubled in under 14 months. And there's also a shift in what kind of nanoengineered materials are being used. When we started the inventory, there was a lot of carbon, sort of nanoengineered carbon in products. Now it's shifted uh, predominantly to silver. And a lot of the nanoengineered silver is used as antimicrobials. So I can buy antimicrobial or nano-treated socks, underwear, shirts. Now we have the nano teddy bear and the nano pacifier and the nano baby toothbrush. All of this is coming from China and Korea. I'll come back a little bit to this, why it's important to think about actually where these things come from. This is another inventory we've, we've got online. So the, the, the real hot spots are actually Boston and Eastern Massachusetts and San Francisco or Silicon Valley. And if you want to have fun, you can actually go in here. We've got all the data uh, ported into Google Maps and you can drill down and actually see what's going on in your neighborhood. The other thing that's occurred is a lot of non-governmental organizations have become involved in, in nano. Up at the very top is the first sort of public protest that occurred at a nano facility. This was in Berkeley, uh, outside of a DOE facility. And these folks, with their back towards you, or as a group called FONG, topless humans organized against genetic manipulation or something like that. Anyway, they, they showed up at a Eddie Bauer store uh, protesting the use of nano in pants. But again, you, you can see here uh, a lot of you know, very high-powered environmental groups, including the Sierra Club, uh, Greenpeace, uh, NRDC. And in fact, the Friends of the Earth have actually submitted a, a petition to the Food and Drug Administration asking them to block or, or essentially put a moratorium on the sale of nano-based sunscreens. So one of the things that's happened is you've got this increased number of NGOs that are active uh, and putting a lot of attention on what's going on with nano. Press coverage has grown. Three or four years ago, you wanted to read about nano. You had to go into peer-reviewed journals. Now we had uh, nano coverage in Cosmopolitan, Allure, uh, Alternative Medicine. So it's getting into the press a lot more. And different types of press. Red Herring Magazine is generally focused on the techies and investors in Silicon Valley. This was a cover nano no-no. We've done a bunch of spots for NPR and the Nightly Business Report, MSNBC. And the coverage is quite interesting. This is some work that's been done at Lehigh by Sharon Friedman. She just tracks how the risks are reported around nano in both the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, and you can see kind of what people are focusing on uh, in terms of coverage of health risk, environmental risks, and regulation. A lot more in the UK on, on do we need to regulate nano.